Yeah. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, great day. Weather finally broke a little bit for us. So it's a little cooler out there. Welcome to the Naval Observatory. And uh, it has been my pleasure and honor to serve as the 54th superintendent for the last 23 months or so. Uh, in the back of the room is Captain Mark Eckert. He's the lucky guy that gets to relieve me. Um, he has relieved me before, so he knows what he's getting into. Um, that's all good news, but uh, very, very glad we were able to pull this off this week. A very busy week for all of us here, um, but I thought it was important to, to get you here and to, uh, to see the Naval Observatory. So I know many of you have been here before, uh, but for those of you who haven't, uh, it's such a national treasure. Um, just the buildings themselves, uh, the things that you'll see on the tours tonight to be able to see uh, what we do here. Everyone thinks, oh, the observatory, that's where the vice president lives. Yes, the vice president lives here in, in my house, by the way. Um, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, nope, not bitter about that at all. Um, but he, uh, you know, there's truly important work, an important mission being done here for the, not just the Department of Defense, uh, but for the nation. And that's because, as we like to say, time starts here. Um, I always thank the Air Force for carrying Navy time around on their GPS satellites. Uh, but it is, you have to have a reference for time. You have to have that one place that everyone can go back to, whether you're in the uh, commercial side or in the government side and the DOD side. Having that reference is incredibly important. Um, obviously on the DOD side, we can't synchronize, we can't correlate, we can't do data fusion, we can't do all of those things that we need to do without accurate time stamping. Um, and then when you start getting into the commercial sector and start talking about financials or you start talking about critical infrastructure, uh, that timing just, it's getting more and more important every day. And I can tell you the Department of Defense over the last couple of years has recognized that. Uh, they've made big investments here at the observatory. Um, they've, they're understanding and putting new policies in place. They're taking a look at the, the cyber threats. Uh, mitigations in cyber on if someone could affect timing, what could happen, and you've all seen a lot of things in open press about that. So, um, you know, enjoy your time here this evening as you're touring around, but in the back of your mind realize how important this place is uh, to the nation. And you can extend that further. Um, how many countries do you think use GPS for time? A lot of them, okay? Uh, I heard earlier even, uh, I think Dana was saying that, you know, even some of our uh, you know, peers in, uh, in Russia and other places use GPS timing because it's just that good, okay? Uh, and it's available, it's free, anybody can get it. Okay, so um, we're starting it here. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, um, you know, the observatory's history because you may not get all of that in the tour. Um, we want to make sure you get to see the good stuff, okay? But we trace our roots back to 1830, and it was because of a chronometer that this place got started. And it was because someone was sailing across the Atlantic and all of a sudden there were the Cape Verde Islands. And they weren't supposed to see them for another 70 miles. And it was because their chronometer had not been rated properly. So this lieutenant came back and he was mad and he said, he wrote a letter to the Secretary of the Navy, it's a lieutenant. And he said, hey, we, we should have a place that has all the chronometers, all the sextants and all the charts so they can all be standardized and calibrated in one place. Three days later, the SecNav said, I agree, here's some money, go do it. Three days to get stand up something. That's fantastic. Um, so that became the depot of charts and instruments. And so Lieutenant Goldsboro rented a house here in Georgetown. That's where they started out. Um, and 13 years later, they built the Naval Observatory down at Foggy Bottom. Um, obvious problems with a place called Foggy Bottom. Um, but some fantastic and, and you know, world-renowned discoveries were made there. We discovered the moons of Mars from there. Um, that was a huge deal back then. Um, much later in the in the uh, you also know, you know timeline, we actually discovered moon of, of, of Pluto as well, leading to Pluto's demise as a planet. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but um, Abraham Lincoln used to talk to the astronomers because he couldn't sleep at night for some reason during the Civil War. But about that time is when the idea of national timing really came into focus because we connected the nation via railroad. So all of a sudden you had trains on the same tracks leaving cities that had different times. Not a good plan. And so uh, I was telling some folks as my, I was leaving, I asked my, my staff asked me, what do you want as a farewell gift? I said, I want one of those Western Union clocks. <laughs> so in every Western Union over Telegraph, they had a big clock on the wall and it said U.S. Naval Observatory time at the bottom. 
They found one on eBay, love eBay. Okay. And so I have this big metal Art Deco clock. But if you think about it, back in the 1860s, the idea of a national time was critically important. And it's, it's only grown from there. So we've been able to distribute time via GPS. Uh, it's, it's everywhere, it's like air. We just take it for granted. Um, we're realizing we can't take it for granted anymore. And so that's where technologies like the Eloran demonstration you're gonna see are so important for us to understand what can we do that is not tied to GPS. But I would tell you, anything we do needs to be referenced back to the Naval Observatory because we want it to be compatible with GPS. And the only way you can do that is if they all come back to the same reference. Um, before I go any further, I do want to uh, congratulate ION. So this is your 70 year anniversary, I believe. Uh, since 1945. So you think about all the technological changes that have happened uh, since ION stood up. Um, there wasn't GPS. So I bet back then the Institute of Navigation thought a lot about sextants, <laughs> uh, almanacs. Well, guess what? We still make those. We still have nautical almanacs. If you need an orange book, we can, uh, we can get you one uh, so that you can go out and take your, uh, your star shots and get a, a perfect fix on the, on the chart. <laughs> Coast Guard guys may be able to do that. Uh, the Navy stopped training to celestial navigation. We're restarting that, um, but we just stopped training to it. It, made, it. We decided GPS was good enough and we didn't need anything else. Okay, so we still do nautical almanacs here. Um, you'll get to see the, the master clock. Um, again, the master clock becomes is actually a bunch of clocks that come together. So about 100 uh, atomic clocks that we have here, uh, including the rubidium fountain clocks, which are the most accurate and stable operational clocks in the world. The uh, key is operational. NIST and others um, do some great science and technology and, and R&D on new clock technologies, and they get some fantastic precision. Um, but they don't run 24-7, 365. We do. So we leverage all that R&D that's being done uh, by NIST and by ONAR and by DARPA and, and others to turn those into new clocks that we can uh, use here to provide that time. I hear a tick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's cool. All right. <laughs> Almost as important is Earth orientation, another mission of ours here. So understanding how the Earth is moving underneath all of those GPS satellites. Okay. It's not a perfect sphere. It doesn't spin perfectly. It wobbles around. It processes. So we actually predict how the Earth is going to move, maneuver or how it's moving. We predict that and provide it to all uh, DOD satellite constellations so they can account for that. Uh, those predictions are the best in the world. Uh, other uh, international partners come and download the hours to use in their systems as well. And we provide that out on the web for free. Um, Astrometry is a, a core mission here. We've been doing that for a long time. Uh, most recently, you saw the New Horizons spacecraft go past Pluto. Um, our Flagstaff Observatory actually provided the navigation information for NASA for that uh, spacecraft to fly by Pluto. So very cool stuff that you know, we get to stay involved in, uh, in astronomy and astrometry. Uh, we're also looking not just at regular celestial navigation, but how do we automate it? How can we, how can we look up with the system and determine our position without actually having a human in the loop. One of the ways we're looking at it is we're not going to look at stars, we're going to look at satellites. We know the orbits of GPS satellites really well, so if we can take bearings to them visually, we can get a fix on the ground. And one of our astronomers have patented that approach called angles only, and uh, we're trying that out right now, uh, you know, getting pretty good results. Again, we're pretty far away from putting it aboard a ship or an aircraft, but that's the focus, that's the direction that we're going. So you can passively do that celestial navigation using satellites, not having to, to look at stars. What can we do in the infrared so we don't have to worry about weather? Then we can do stuff in the daytime. So we're still doing active research here at the observatory in navigation and providing that subject matter expertise uh, across the DOD, uh, into academia, into uh, the government side as well. So it's kind of the crux of what I wanted to talk to you about. I uh, thank you all for coming up here. Um, I'm glad the weather is good because you'll be walking around a little bit tonight. So you're going to get to see uh, Building 1, which is the historic building here, built in 1893. Once uh, They built it way out here in the country where the city would never get to. <laughs> um, 
after a well, foggy bottom, we had a few astronomers die from malaria, so we had to kind of kind of get out of the city. Um, you'll see a time ball on the roof. Uh, that time ball here is uh, more symbolic. We don't actually drop the time ball every day, but when it was in foggy bottom, they had a time ball and they dropped it every day. Um, the building was designed by the Vanderbilt's architect, Richard Morris Hunt, so that's why it looks like it does, and I'm really glad that's who they picked. Um, it's a great building. Uh, you'll get to see our 12-inch telescope. Uh, hopefully we'll have some clear skies tonight and be able to take a look at Saturn. Uh, had great shots of Saturn uh, the last couple of weeks. Um, probably won't get to see the 26-inch. I don't think we're going to. Are we going to the 26? We're going to the 26-inch? Okay, this is where I wish the congressman was here. He isn't here yet, is he? Is he here? Soon. Soon. Uh, soon. 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 Okay, still in traffic. Can't believe you got stuck in traffic in D.C. 26-inch <laughs> uh, telescope purchased in 1873. We still use it operationally today. And a matter of fact, we just finished an automation of it to where our astronomers no longer have to sit in the dome. They can sit in the air-conditioned comforter of their office and uh, use that telescope. We think we're going to get 30% more efficiency out of it. And I always like to tell that to Congress. And look at how well Navy invests their money. <laughs> you know, we've been using this thing for 142 years now. Um, but we use it to look at double stars and binaries and, uh, and, and systems um, that are used a lot for navigation because they're very bright, uh, but because they're binaries, that center of light moves around. And we can still use that telescope, and we have not touched the lenses uh, since they were manufactured. They were hand ground, a guy want with his thumb, um, back in 1873. So really, truly uh, a neat piece of history you can see. And then you'll get to see the rubidium fountain clocks uh, that were designed and built right here on campus. Um, about 40 Nobel Prizes in physics went into those clocks, and we've got uh, some of the, the top uh, the clock physicists in the world who then built them in our machine shop. And they've been operating some of them for three years straight, and uh, best performance, they, they changed the way they compute UTC in Paris based on the performance of our fountain clocks. So that's how good they are. So thanks for coming. Uh, enjoy the evening. Ask a lot of questions. Um, if they can't answer them, let me know. I got two days left. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it looks to be a great night, and again, good to see you all. Thanks.